Welcome back. I hope you have a full cup of hot brewed coffee. I can smell the aroma right here. And uh, yes, I can see that pastry sitting there on the coffee table. So enjoy while we continue our message on um, God's good providence in the storyline of the Palm Sunday events. If you're just joining us, let me go back and just recap a couple of things here. Uh, we were in John chapter 11 and looking at uh, the resurrection of Lazarus and the events that have taken place since then, the early part of chapter 12, where uh, we have a celebration of life party taking place in Bethany, and it's at the home of Simon the leper, and Lazarus is there, and Martha is there, and Mary is there, and um, I, I just want to pick up on um, a point here that I failed to give uh, earlier, and that is this. As you see this celebration of life dinner taking place, I think we could say that these people here are spiritually aligned in their relationship with Christ. We might ask ourselves the question, what does a spiritually aligned relationship with Christ do for us? We mentioned Martha. Martha is here serving, verse 2. You see, when we have a properly aligned relationship with Christ, it provides service without objection. Do you remember earlier? Uh, in the ministry of Christ, where Jesus had visited Mary and Martha in Lazarus' home, and Martha objected to Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus had commented to Martha, Martha, you're busy about too many things. You really need to take a break and do what Mary is doing. Here we find she's serving without objection. Her heart is aligned with Christ. We also see a second thing in, in and that is this, that we find uh, perhaps Lazarus and Simon who are in fellowship with an eternal perspective. Um, Lazarus being resurrected from the dead. Simon being healed from leprosy. Both of these men, one experiencing death, the other facing death now are in fellowship with an eternal perspective. Yes, they've re they have life, but they're looking at Jesus. They're looking at eternity. They're looking at the future. And during these times, uh, we have opportunity to serve, but we need to have an eternal perspective. And then lastly, we've got Mary, who is spiritually aligned with Jesus, and she demonstrates a sacrificial act of worship. All of this is going on at the celebration. A sacrificial act of worship. Do we find ourselves worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in a sacrificial way? Now, we do it when it's convenient. Uh, we do it on a regular basis. But do we do it sacrificially? Are we willing to attribute worth to Jesus Christ in a sacrificial way? And so here's some points that I think are worth noting uh, in scene three uh, during the celebration of life. Well, let's move on. And we're going to get to John chapter 12. If you're just joining us, go to John chapter 12 uh, and verse number 12. And now we are going to call what I call scene number four. And uh, scene number four is the triumphal entry. Uh, let's look at verse number 12. Uh, I wonder how many of you folks out there like parades? We've all been to them. And uh, we're going to see a parade that's going to take place. And it, it, it appears, it appears that although this is something that God has planned uh, in eternity past, uh, and as a matter of fact, we find that we have some Old Testament prophecies regarding this event that takes place. 
but it appears that it may be a bit spontaneous for the people. Now, it's not spontaneous for Jesus. Jesus is quite aware of the plan, uh, but, it, but it appears to be a bit spontaneous. And, and we, we get this um, from verse number uh, 18. Uh, the reason for, well, let, let, let's hold up there. Let's, let's go back to verse number 12. Uh, we find that this, this parade begins for many as a triumphal celebration. Look at this. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They heard about it. He's coming. And so here... Here we find this spontaneous result from a human perspective. From eternity past, here in verse 13, the response is something that God has prompted and prodded into the hearts of men there in Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Here we find this response that is taking place. We find that uh, as they as they pronounce this this grand uh, cry of of worship and praise, the word Hosanna means save now. It's actually part of Psalms one hundred eighteen. Uh, verses 25 and 26, you'll see the, the very, very same words there. Um, they are also presenting Jesus as a king, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, they say. And the one who comes prophetically, verses 14 and 15. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. From the book of Zechariah, chapter 9. Verses 9 through 12. In chapter 14, verse number 9. Here's what John records for us. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. For many, this is a triumphal celebration. For the disciples, they were clueless. <laughs> you would think, you would think the disciples would be putting, begin putting the pieces of the puzzle together and saying, look what's happening. Old Testament prophecy is being fulfilled. Mm, no. Look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. For the disciples, they were clueless. You know, isn't it interesting that God uses the spontaneity of men? God is going to use the cluelessness of the disciples. Verse 17 tells us something. It's that's very interesting as well. Well, let's go back to verse 16. Uh, there's a conjunction here. A little bit of an editorial comment again. John inserts this. Uh, but when Jesus was glorified, you see, he's not glorified yet. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The light finally came on. Folks, I feel like I'm a disciple so many times. Walking down the pathway of life and experiencing something, and it's like, oh, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do with this. And so we kind of muddle our way through it. And then a little bit later, um, the Lord shows us that here's what this is all about. So we can't blame the disciples for their lack of understanding. We're all there. But they did, they did come to realize it. 
And uh, I think that when the light turned on, they probably said, oh, Lord, you're a great God. Thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. Look what you did in spite of what we understand. Uh, that's something we ought to be able to think about. God does things beyond our understanding. Isn't that a good thing? All right. All right. Verse number 17. We found the crowd. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. What was their response? They continued to bear witness. Now, who was this crowd? You know, I think this crowd was probably the Jewish political faithful. All right. So, so, so they were the group that says, you know, we need change. We need change. Um, the, the current governing body is not getting it done. Uh, we're oppressed by the Romans. And, and so here you have this, this group that, that saw Jesus, that, that witnessed his miracles and said, here's our, here's our king. This, this is the kind of king we need. This is the kind of leader we need. Why aren't we making him king? Wow. You talk about, uh, you know, logical, rational. I think most of us would probably be in that crowd and said, let's make Jesus king. Let's continue to... And they continue to bear witness. They, they, con they continue the campaign of, of, of pushing Jesus forward to be king. And then it says here in verse number 18, this crowd, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. He called Lazarus out of the tomb. That's the sign. So, so you had these people that were there because Jesus did this miraculous event. Now, let me say this. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there were within that crowd people who said, I believe he's more than just Jesus, the miracle worker. I think he is the Christ. No doubt there were, there were people who were authentic believers here. But we see here that this is a, a group of people that are politically minded, that are socially minded. They, they just wanna, they want, they wanna, they wanna fulfill the kingdom promises found in the Old Testament. So, so let's make Jesus king. A good Jew, a good honest Old Testament biblical Jew would say, this has gotta be the guy. Then verse 19, we find the enemies of Jesus. Um, they were, quite frustrated. It says here, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. To some in Jerusalem, this was not a happy parade at all. They were not happy about Jesus coming in, riding on a donkey, having all of this acknowledgement People crying out, saying he should be the king. In Luke chapter 19, verse 39 and 40, Luke records this for us. He says, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. This shouldn't be taking place. Rebuke your disciples. This, this, could, this could cause some kind of chaos. But he answered them, I tell you, if these, my disciples, were silent, the very stones would cry out. You see, this was a significant event. This was an event that was going to indeed declare Jesus to be the blessed one, the one who was coming in the name of Jehovah. God. He is the one who is the king of Israel. Even the stones would make that grand proclamation. John MacArthur makes an interesting 
observation of this passage. We could say here, in God's providence, in God's eternal plan, that's wise and that's holy and that leads to the ultimate glorification of himself. John MacArthur says, the story of the triumphal entry is one of contrast. First of all, it's a contrast in, in presentation. It is the story of the king who came as a lowly servant on a donkey. There's your contrast. Not a prancing steed, not in royal robes, but he came on the clothes of the poor and the humble. A contrast of presentation. In God's providence, there's a contrast of purpose. Jesus Christ came to conquer by his own sacrifice, by his love, by his grace, by his mercy. All for his people. In contrast, his kingdom is not of armies and splendor. His kingdom is of lowliness and servant. He doesn't seek to conquer nations, but he conquers the hearts and minds of his people. And then thirdly, there's this contrast of message. So in God's providence, the triumphal entry is a contrast. Of, in, in, there's a contrast in his message. His message is one of peace with God. You certainly don't see peace amongst the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the chief priests. His message is one of peace with God. If Jesus has made a triumphal entry into our hearts, he reigns there in peace and with God. And so in the day and age that we live, we can go out amongst our community, amongst our family, amongst our friends, and there ought to pour forth from our hearts peace and hope because Jesus is King. Jesus reigns in our hearts as, as Lord and, and Savior. What a wonderful, wonderful observation. And so we find here God uses the spontaneity of men in his, in his good providence. But then we find scene number five. Let's go to scene five. And in scene five, we, be, we pick up John chapter 11 and verse number 20. This is interesting. We find here that public testimony in the providence of God Public testimony, Jesus coming as king, coming in on the, the triumphal entry. It's a public testimony of who Jesus is. The public testimony of who Jesus is provides an opportunity. Look at verse 20. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Isn't this interesting? Not only do we have Jewish people here in Jerusalem, we've got some Greeks that are here that, that have forsaken their, their pagan gods and says, you know, what? I, think the, I think the God of the Jews is, is the true God. The God of the Jews is the true God. And so they're, they're there in Jerusalem and they're there trying to be a part of this, this celebration of, of the Passover. And so apparently they've, they've, they've been introduced to the Old Testament. They've been introduced to the to the, to the book of Exodus, and, 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 and they're saying, this is real, and this is the God we ought to embrace. And so anyway, they're there. And so what do they do? They, they, they're there. They're part of the crowd. They, they, uh, they, they see Jesus. And uh, it says here that uh, these came to Philip, and they, Philip, who was from the who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Now, this is just a side. Um, perhaps some of these Greeks 
were also from Galilee, from Bethsaida. Um, interesting, interesting little town here. Uh, this, this word Bethsaida means simply this, house of hunting. Okay, side note, side note, side note. Matt, tell us something about these Greeks. They may be from the same town of Philip, the house of hunting. And uh, for us guys that are, um, you know, part of this ministry and whatnot, we enjoy hunting. And um, here we've got a little insight to the area of Bethsaida that it was a place of, of fishing. It was a place of wildlife. And uh, it was a place where men were in touch with nature, you know, kind of thing. Uh, I'm thinking that Philip was just your everyday, ordinary kind of guy who enjoyed fishing and hunting. And these Greeks may have been the same. Um, they came to Philip because maybe they saw that, you know, hey, we've got something here in common. And verse 21, they come to him and says, uh, sir, we would wish to see Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that a great request? How refreshing that is in light of the spirit and the attitude of the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and the governing body. Here you've got some Greeks, common Gentiles, pagans, who've learned that there's one true God, the creator God who's created deer and fish in this earth. And and everything around it, and and he's a glorious God, and we 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 would wish to see Jesus. So, what would you expect when you come to see Jesus? Well, look at verse twenty-two. So Philip went up and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And whether or not these Gentiles were following Philip and Andrew, you know, I think they probably were. It's like kind of like, hey, these are the guys. If, if, if these, if, if anybody can get us in touch with Jesus, these guys can. And I can just imagine this group of Gentile guys, you know, following Andrew and Philip, and, because Jesus turns and and he answers them. So, what would you expect? What would you expect to hear if you were coming to see Jesus? Well, here is his word to them. Here's his word. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Is it interesting that Jesus identifies himself with them as the Son of Man? He's 100% man. But he's going to be glorified as the Son of God. What a statement. The hour has come. What does that mean? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Our lives are like a seed. And our lives <clears throat> can bring forth fruit. And the only way our lives can bring forth fruit is if we die to self. We die to our own aspirations. We die to our own glory. Then he says, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We have the illustration of the wheat that falls into the earth. We have the principle that comes from that. Um, are you going to love your life or are you going to hate your life? We have an application. If anyone serves me, he must follow. It's time to follow. And then, we have a promise, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. 
So what's the result of coming to Jesus? Much fruit, verse 24. Eternal life, verse 25. Honor, verse 26. Let's get a little application here. The application is this. Jesus is no respecter of person. In the providence of God, in the plan and purposes of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are not respecters of persons. The salvation offered from Jesus Christ, from God the Father, from the Spirit of God, his salvation is for all classes of men. The scripture says this, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The ones calling on him, whoever they are, they will be saved. The ones following him, whoever they are, will be honored. That was scene five. Let's move on to our last scene, scene six. In verse number six, Jesus now relates to those around him a truth that they would not be able to see. We've said that God's providence involves responses, preparation, the the spontaneity of man. Uh, The providence of God provides testimony, um, or a public testimony that provides opportunity. Now we're going to see that the providence of God provides trouble. It contains trouble. Look at verse number 27. Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. Isn't it interesting? We have this grand celebration of life with Lazarus and Simon the leper and Mary and Martha. We have this wonderful triumphal entry where the crowds are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have this group of Greeks who come and seek Jesus. But Jesus reveals his soul. He says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. One of the things I think we need to realize is that Jesus came as a son of man. Here we have a great illustration of Christ facing his death, facing the truth of his mission. And it did trouble us so. Not in a way that rattled his faith, not in a way that any way compromised his character, It's okay to have a troubled soul if you respond accordingly. We find here Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. Again, God has called us to a unique mission as his children. He's called us to glorify his name. In that moment, another miracle happened. John records for us, then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The words of God. (laughs) Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful response. God the Father responds to his son, the son of man. In his time of trouble, 
God speaks. God's good providence. He continues to speak to us through his word. He continues to abide with us through the presence of his spirit. He continues to give us peace, peace aligning with trouble so that we can glorify him. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Obviously, the crowd didn't know how to process this. And had we been there, maybe we wouldn't have known how to process it either. But Jesus answered and he says, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Something else is happening. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now, I don't know where the disciples went with their minds when Jesus, when Jesus said this. You know, we know, we know the end of the story. What a blessing. What a blessing, what a blessing to be able to put it all together. I'll tell you where my mind goes. My mind goes back to Genesis 3, verse 15. Do you think Satan could have been present in the background here? We don't know. We don't know. But Jesus said this, the serpent, the head of the serpent will be crushed. Just a reminder, the head of the serpent will be crushed. Verse 33, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Let's close with these thoughts. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? They were not connecting the dots. It's okay. They've just had a big celebration. Their minds are elsewhere. A lot has happened. So Jesus simply says, the light is among you. For a little while longer. Walk while you have the light. Let darkness overtake you. What an invitation. An invitation to those that were around. Simply, simply, simply accept the light. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. Thinking Judas is kind of wondering what's going on at this moment. Lest darkness overtake you, the one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become the sun. So again, in the providence of God, in God's good providence, in God's good plan, the ultimate goal for mankind to walk in the light, to possess the light, to believe in the light that you may become the sons of light. As you look at your own soul, what do you see there? Darkness or light? Religion or relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? This Easter season be a great time to repent. And believe. Our Father, we are thankful for this season of life. We are thankful for the record that we have of your Son. Father, we're thankful for this celebration of life that's been recorded for us and the lessons that we can learn from it. God, I pray that in this season there may be some. We call upon you. 
in repentance and belief. Father, I pray that you would honor your word, honor your son, that you might be glorified in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.